So I think one of the biggest benefits that I have in my role as a field CDO is really understanding the perspective of the customer and really understanding their their challenges, the the language that they speak, the the priorities. And that's not always something they are always open to articulating with, especially to a vendor. Hi, everyone. My name is Casey Lai. I am the founder of Prometheum and love talking about all things data management, data analytics, and of course, data fabric. So welcome to this installment of the Data Fabric Show. And I am joined by my good friend and esteemed guest, Ms. Peggy Tsai from Big ID. She is the Chief Data Officer of Big ID. And for those of you who may not know, Peggy is quite the celebrity uh, Chief Data Officer in our industry. Before Big ID, she was actually at Morgan Stanley. Is that correct, Peggy? That's right. Um, doing, doing a lot of great stuff around governance, privacy, uh, security. And so so Peggy is kind of very interesting because you know she's worked you know on both sides, right? As the customer, you know, working with vendors, trying to implement data governance strategies and data management strategies and trying to implement a lot of these solutions. And now she's on the vendor side, right, with Big ID, and then again, working with customers as well, taking on a topic very similar to her, privacy, security, and governance as well. So I think she's got a very interesting background, very interesting perspective. So we're going to talk about kind of how Peggy sees what's going on in the world today, where, you know, how that, you know, translates into what a CDO has to do to be effective in today's organization. And of course, you know, how her firm Big ID is actually leading the way to do that. And so I'd love to kind of talk about that in the context, you know, AI, love to talk to, to that in the context of data fabric. And, you know, for us, it's to get to know Peggy a little bit better for those of you who don't know her, although many of you probably do because she is kind of a rock star celebrity chief data officer. So Peggy, welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you, Casey. That was a very generous introduction. I don't know. There's plenty of other rock star field <laughs> chief data officers out there, but there's certainly many of us, as you pointed out, that have made the transition between being a practitioner, being on the vendor side, many consultants. I think there's a lot of integration now in the roles. And it's very interesting that you said my background. When previously, when I was a practitioner, I focused mainly on data governance, data management, but I think in recent years, we've seen the chief data officer role really combine more of the privacy, the compliance aspect of it and security aspect of it. And that's how my role and function has evolved as well. But it's fairly a new phenomenon, I would say, just in the last couple of years, this merger of data officer and their mm -hmm. function expanding beyond just data management and data governance. That's, that's actually a great point. And, you know, I'd love to kind of dig into that a little bit more. Maybe before we do that, maybe for the folks who are not familiar with Big ID, maybe you want to just take a minute or two and tell us a little bit about Big ID and the great stuff that you guys are doing. Sure, absolutely. So Big ID, we are an AI machine learning data discovery platform. So we help companies auto discover and classify their data, whether it's unstructured or structured or pipeline data, and really create a virtualized catalog that's always up to date. And on top of that catalog, what we allow customers to do is really identify the data intelligence that they need for data lifecycle management. So whether it's retention or remediation or data deletion, it's really difficult to do that at scale and to be in compliance with different privacy regulations and now AI regulations, and also understanding your security and risk exposure to data, data access. So those are the type of challenges that we help companies solve. And recently, just yesterday, Casey, I was proud to announce that Big ID is also CDMC certified. So the EDM wow. Council, which is a trade association that some of you may have heard of, has been promoting the cloud data management capabilities framework for the last two years. And we are the first tech vendor to have all 14 controls inside our platform. 
So it's something that I've been working very hard to push for. It's a rigorous process and review that we've had to, to ensure and undergo testing that our product can meet all these 14 controls, but we, we've done it. So with partnership nice. with AWS and with Google, we're happy to be able to launch this for our customers and all our prospects out there. Congratulations. That that sounds like a lot of work and it sounds like it's going to be a lot of value that you can add to a lot of CDO lot of organizations. So kudos to you guys on that. So Peg, let's kind of get back to you a little bit, right? Because, you know, you've been on both sides. You probably saw, you know, a lot of the challenges that a lot of the CDOs and customers that you're talking to. You know, maybe, you know, if you can, don't mind, maybe share a little bit about kind of how your experience, right, as a practitioner kind of shaped you as, you know, in your current role as, you know, CEO of Big Ideas, you're working with other customers, all different sizes, as well as all different maturity levels uh, when it comes to data management, data privacy. Maybe share a little bit about kind of how that background has kind of shaped you in terms of how you are working in your current role. Yeah, so I think one of the, biggest benefits I have in my role as a field CDO is really understanding the perspective of the customer and really understanding their their challenges, the, the language that they speak, the, the priorities. And that's not always something they are always open to articulating with, especially to a vendor. And now that I sit on the other side, I can really understand, um, you know, some of the some some of the differences in you know communication certainly, but focus mainly on you know I've been in financial services uh, my prior role so being in regulated industries re I really know what the processes are internally that companies have to go through to meet the different regulations and the underlying data that's needed to be created and generated for for the reporting and for the demonstrating the as uh, the requirements so having that understanding that real experience has helped me one with having better conversations with with the customers because i can really maybe maybe a little bit more sympathy certainly okay. and products out there have a lot of different capabilities right so being able to in the first few minutes, just articulate exactly the solution that they're looking for, really understand the gap that they're facing and the challenge they have, right? So I, I think that's the biggest, I think the biggest benefit. And I think for also for the longest time, the industry of data management, data governance has been very catalog driven, meaning that there's been a lot of manual curation of, of data and a lot of manual work that was needed to identify critical data elements to manually map out the lineage and traceability of the the assets to manually write data quality rules mm -hmm. and being on the vendor side I've seen a lot of that shift now towards more towards automation machine learning and certainly that still hasn't completely caught up in terms of yeah. adoption and usage in in a lot of the industries so there's still high maturity in technology yeah. tools, but still a slow adoption rate. And for me, it's understanding. Do you think that's a little bit threatening? Or if you're the customer, you're like, wait a minute, I used to do all this. So my team, my teams of people used to do all this. And now all these tools are coming because I, I definitely... You know, I, I definitely hear you, right? Obviously, from from where we sit, I'm on the vendor side as well, right? So, like everyone, every vendor I know is pushing more automation, more AI, more Gen AI, more self learning, etc. And so, it's going to automate, accelerate all these manual processes, right? And you're you're hundred percent right. We've been very manually catalog driven, I would say, across the industry for a long time. Do you feel like maybe there's a little bit of hmm, uncertainty, fear, uncomfortable resentment, you know, from the customer side when they see kind of this onslaught of innovation and automation coming? Yes and no. I mean, certainly I think that a lot of the hesitation comes from the actual people doing and using the tools, whereas the excitement, you know, usually comes from the top on the executive side. 
So there's still what I would say is lack of maturity when it comes to the data culture, the data literacy of the organization to really move it towards better adoption, stronger adoption. And essentially, it's not just technologies around data, but I think technology in general. The mm. how quickly companies adopt emerging technologies will keep it competitive in, in the marketplace. I mean, it's, it doesn't yeah. require this industry. So that's like a period right there. Emerging technology adoption is, is really key. And how co- how much companies invest in educating and upskilling their employees is, is really critical. I, I would say that there's a turnover now and I'm seeing this shift probably more towards employees base because I see it from the top. I see a shift in the chief data officer level, shifting away from the 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 mindset of finding and searching for data and identifying authority of data sources, really the, what I would say the traditional way of doing data management. And now how can we do AI for AI? Like how can we leverage AI technologies to support our generative AI initiatives? So I see a lot of that being a stronger proponent of encouraging and fostering uh, data governance programs because data governance programs will not survive the way it has been in the past. It needs mm-hmm. to sustain and support generative AI projects. And that is... Do you actually think it's, it's, it's a good thing? You actually think the, the advent and the high interest and kind of rapid drive toward adopting AI, Gen AI, is, is actually giving a purpose to mm-hmm. data governance. Okay, that, that's actually a re- really good perspective. Absolutely. Just like I was... So thankful when GDPR was passed, I felt that privacy, <laughs> privacy regulation. I think for those of us who've been in the data catalog space, that was like the best thing that ever happened to data catalog vendor, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, it's always about the carrot and the stick. And for for many companies, there needs to be a stick rather than yeah. a, a carrot. So having some of these regulations and some of the upcoming AI regulations it's going to continually drive for better, better data. Mm. And I think that this is where I do make a distinction between technology and data because we can continually evolve and have better technology, but without the underlying data, people's understanding of data, the proper usage of data and consumption of data, doesn't matter what the technology is. It won't it still wouldn't be used correctly in any organization. So absolutely, I think the now the hype cycle or i don't think it's a hype (laughs) the generative ai wave is that 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 train has left that train has passed (laughs) Uh, i I know that gartner was trying to question whether it's a hype or not i think it's here it's here to stay it's this is not another blockchain conversation this is really we've seen the we've seen the adoption we've seen the usage we've seen the investments not just in companies the new startups around this space. So it's it's really exciting and none of it is possible without the proper proper usage of data. And we've seen it with even with things like different co-pilots. If you're limited by the scope of data that you can include in your large language models, the results are not going to be as as accurate as people expect. It's interesting because I think you and I were both at the MIT CDO show, I think two weeks ago or so. Not too long ago. It's Seems like what, well, but two weeks ago, and, and so I, I gave a talk on basically the the challenges towards for CDOs to adopt Gen AI, and the top three challenges that every CDO cited. This was a survey that Gardner actually did. The first one was, can I trust the data? Right, relevancy and accuracy. That was number one, right? Which I think is super important. Can't black box it. Right. Number two is the data integration challenges, right? Very difficult to have a single LM talk to all the different data management tools that you have, which unfortunately is kind of how most organizations have built their data architecture with the kind of piecemeal modern data stack. Um, but the third, not surprising, is how do you make sure that Gen AI, when you're adopting it, is not going to compromise governance, privacy, and security, right? Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, to your point, I think it, there's an opportunity. I, people shouldn't see it as something threatening. Like there's an opportunity now for us 
to adopt our governance strategy, privacy strategy, security strategies towards enabling Gen AI for our organization. So what you're saying is definitely being felt by all the uh, CDOs and executives of different organizations. It's top of mind for a lot of these folks. So, I mean, I guess in your role, you talk to so many customers, Peggy, and you, you hear all these challenges and so forth. I mean, what what advice would you give, right, to organizations? Because it's, I think it's pretty hard being a CDO when the vendor landscape is so vast. I always like to joke, everyone says the same thing. Everyone puts the same buzzwords on the websites and on the collateral. And oftentimes it takes, you know, quite a lot of time or someone really, really technical to be able to quickly distinguish and differentiate the tools. There's just so much noise out there. And so what would your advice be? I know you spend a lot of time coaching, training other fellow CDOs as well. You know, especially now with Gen AI, I feel like it's, <laughs> if you thought it was bad, I think with Gen AI, it's gotten even a lot worse because now there's an onslaught of Gen AI, Gen AI this from Gen AI vendors, but now there's also every other traditional data vendor somehow has a Gen AI story, right? And I think it's very confusing. So love to hear from you, Peggy. Like, what advice would you give to your fellow CDOs out there? Well, I can give advice to other vendors as well as to other chief <laughs> data officers as well. But what I would say is I, I completely agree with your your points here, Casey, because it is very confusing. I think that if a CDO is not as educated to you know, to all the marketing collateral, it does sound very similar. But I actually had a, a really great conversation with a CDO of a regional bank recently and actually was very impressed by the way that he was not swayed by all of the vendor conversations. And that was because he was very clear on the vision of the bank and the direction that they needed to go in terms of the roadmap and the strategy, and he knew what capabilities. So it was something that he articulated with his stakeholders on very clearly what the key and core capabilities were inside his, for, for him to be successful. First, he needed to eliminate all the redundant technologies that he inherited. So I think that was very smart of him, regardless of... I'm representing a vendor, but I think it was very key for him to understand all the duplications and similarities and really get rid of what was not necessary. And then the second phase was to identify what gaps in his technology toolkit he needs to fill that would help him get him there. So I mm -hmm. think that type of focus helps CDOs avoid getting distracted by the next shiny tool or technology and making sure that everything fits cohesively. So it's building the best of breed, which I completely am supportive of because there's not one vendor and one solution that's going to do it all, but how can they all play with each other and integrate with each other holistically to get him towards the goals that right. he established and that his well, there's, there's no there's no one environment that's the same for everyone. Exactly, anymore, right? one environment that's the same. And also last but not least, is to to trust the vendors that he did choose, okay? Mm -hmm. And this is a little selfish plug on, on behalf of both of us, but <laughs> any vendor that you do choose, you have to trust the team and the partnership, hopefully, that you built and ensure that any gaps that you need will be fulfilled by your partners. And if not, then well, make changes. But that's the kind yeah. of trust that and focus that I think all chief data officers need to have because they're gonna, all C-suites are bombarded by many vendors, yeah. but to have a very clear focus really helps to have these convers smarter conversations, more efficient conversations. And it's it's all about delivering value, business value on, on his side. So it's, so these, those those are a few things I would suggest. Yeah, those are a good advice. I'm just going to recap. So I think the first thing you said was this particular CDO kind of 
very, very quickly figure out their landscape that they have tools they have and figure out, hey, where, where's all the overlap and where's mm-hmm. all the redundancy and figure out, let's get rid of the redundancy, which I think is very smart, not just from a cost perspective, right? But also the more redundancy and overlap you have, right? It's going to complicate workflows and it's going yes. to lower productivity, right? So I think that's super smart. Next thing is like, okay, now that I've done that, Right. Let me focus on what I want to do and then what capabilities I want to get there. Um, and then as part of that, you bring up a, a very good point, And that is, you know, not not to treat vendors as someone who's just going to come and sell you something and install it, but really treating them as a partner. Right. And it's like this, you know, we're going to work together to get to this goal. And it's something I've always believed in. Right. I always ask, you know, our customers and prospects, like, how can I help? What else can I help with? Even if it's stuff that's not related to Prometheum or Data Fabric, because we all come from the industry. We've all worn different hats. Uh, and so there's, you know, either people we know, firms that we know, or we've just seen kind of different implementations that we can always help. And I would say, you know, a lot of customers who you know have been very successful, you know, really tap into kind of this, you know, close knit relationship they have, right? They treat their their vendors as strategic partners. And I think they get a lot out of that, you know, for 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 the for the customers out there, the non-vendors out there, let me tell you, you get a lot out of that relationship. Vendors are much, much more happier to work with you. And that usually means you're gonna get a lot of goodies that you probably don't have to pay for or probably paying at a much lower price. So it's it's smart on both ways, right? Not just financially, but you know, the more folks you have that's part of your virtual team uh, working towards that same shared goal, you're you're going to be more successful, right? I think one of the hard truths, Peggy, as you know, is it, 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 the, the CDO job is a tough job, and average tenure is about twenty seven months. You know, I'm, unfortunately, I've known a lot of great friends for CDOs who you know kind of fall into that statistic. And so, you know, I always like to, you know, when I engage with CDOs, like, let me help you, please, right? Okay. Because your success and my success and our success is really all tied together, right? At the end of the day, and so I think you you bring up a good point, and it's something that I've definitely seen time and time again. So thanks, thanks for that. And I think, you know, we, we've talked about kind of your your perspective, your advice, talked about kind of how AI is changing the way we think about things but you know it's it could be a positive thing right you know i think lastly you know wanted to kind of just you know because this is the data fabric show right have to kind of get you know your thoughts your perspective like how do you see data fabric you know play out in this you know role this this day of ai this day of generative ai this new kind of frontier that we're getting into love to just hear from your side peggy yeah no but before i answer that question i just want to also note say that the CDO role is so precarious at this point because it's not just a a data function anymore. It's a technology function. It's a privacy security function. (laughs) It's such a complex ecosystem of collaborators. And the chief data officer needs to be the one that is coordinating all these different efforts across different teams. So I would say probably 10 years ago, a chief data officer would not need to know about data fabrics or about data engineering or any of those aspects, but now it's under their responsibility. So the execution of data in in, in a structure like data fabric is, is so key for a chief data officer because it's not just about the quality of the data, but now their responsibilities have expanded so much Um and I think that's that's what makes a chief data officer so much of a, a unicorn, right? And I hear this from recruiters all the time that are looking for chief data officers, the complexity and the knowledge that they have to know internally, externally, from a technical point of view, oh, business knowledge. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's both wide and deep, right? Because yeah. you have to know not just the tech, right? That That's number one. Number two is you have to know about your business. Right. Like you're there, there's always specific industry specific domain knowledge that is so key to what the solutions have to do and what your SLA is, what you're responsible for. But three, you brought up a good point is got the people wrangling that I have to see chief data officer do. It's often really tough because 
sometimes they're not with IT, right? They're separate organizations. So they have to work with IT to get things done. Then they finally get a solution in, but then they have to work with all the different business units, right? From not just a budget perspective, because a lot of times, I don't know, from your experience, a lot of times I've seen chief of officers, they don't really have a budget by themselves. Like mm -hmm. they, you know, they work with the business to kind of secure that. And what I see is, there's two challenges. One is obviously they have to kind of build a compelling business case and understand the business case from the business to be able to, you know, secure the budget that they need. But two is how do they, how do you get that buy-in not only to do the purchase, but to do the implementation and the that's adoption? The that's the hard part. That's the hardest part. And I think that's really yeah. where is the difference between a successful and long, the longevity of a chief data officer that's the difference. I think I've seen chief data officers who've been in their role successfully for four or five years. I mean, that's abnormal, right? As, as you said, yeah. but they've been able to get, gain the trust of the CEO, the part, forming the f strong partnerships with their, their other peers and making themselves more important, you know, making their role really more integrated into the other functions and demonstrating the value of their role. And also, as you said, persuading others. I mean, especially in the in the world of Gen AI, we've seen many, in many companies, leaders take want to take and own that responsibility, right? And I know there's been a lot of talk, especially in the US federal agency side, to nominate a AI officer. We've seen this role added to a chief data officer, or it's a separate function, AI as a separate officer than the data officer. And that can cause its own trouble because they are building again. We're, 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 we're just finally trying to figure, We've I think we finally figured out how to coexist between the chief data officer role and the CIO role. And now they're going to add an AI oh, oh, officer God. role. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So it's like wow. you're going to have like many different silos of, of functions and processes probably repeating itself and duplicating its technology solutions as well. But again, this is where knowledge is key and being persuasive is, is really important for a chief data officer. But fundamentally, each company needs different things from a chief data officer. And, and I've only been able to learn this from talking to many, many companies. One, each chief data officer has a different remit, different responsibilities. It's a combination of where they sit in the organization, who they report to, the, the main initiatives, but also what the priorities are for the business and their maturity. Every company has a different maturity level. So a lot of the earlier and easier conversations that I have with customers are still around just managing and governing their data, having a good remediation process, for example, or a good deletion process of their data, or they're still scanning and, you know, just wanting, wanting to do good analytics and reporting on their data, right? And then there's another higher maturity companies that have taken their data governance programs and just been able to accelerate it at such high speeds and just in just less than a year, I've seen them do really good quality work on the managing and governing their unstructured data, being able to, to leverage that for their large language models, for the Gen AI projects, you know, so it's been really amazing. And I think there's just gonna be a wide, even a larger widening gap as days and months go ahead this year for companies to, be really differentiated from each other. I think last year I would have said the time is now to start AI, but I feel like in in this time, I would say if you haven't done it, it's almost a little too late. The train. You got you to gotta get going. Really you got to go. Well, I mean, I think, you know, to, to, their, to the defense of the folks, I, I think they tried, but it there are obstacles, right? It's not as straightforward. I think the market, the hype definitely was full tilt in 2022, 2023. And so a lot of people probably thought it was just as easy as 
you want me to just get a vector database in LLM and call it a day or a large like you know and I think what we're finding is well that's not the case and I think it's reassuring you know Gartner just did a 2024 CIO survey on the state of gen AI and look at the kind of challenges of adoption right so I think it was you know I think it was comforting for a lot of folks to see like oh my gosh I wasn't the only one right in terms of facing those challenges so i i do i do agree with you but you know i'm gonna be a little bit sympathetic uh because i think it, it's been tough you know if if you can think of one thing one wish you could have peggy closing thoughts right one wish it, it could be either i wish the industry landscape would do this or it could be i wish chief data officers would do this mm -hmm. what would that be well, what do you think that one wish would be? <laughs> You'll get um, I have, <laughs> I have a lot of wishes. It could be, it can be answered in, in so many ways. But I wish that chief data officers would be empowered. Every chief data officer would be empowered in their organization to execute on their plan, whether they're challenged because of funding or because of support. But if we, if every board can give the full power to the chief data officer or in the chief data and AI officer, or even data and analytics officer to really do their job and give them that time and space and resources to execute. I think they will see the, the value and the ROI from it. I think companies often have very short attention span to, to see that delivery to the end, or they just don't fully fund it and give the right resources and technology resources to it. But I think it, too many of these programs fail because they has just been yeah. cut short. And I really I wish that chief day officers could have that power to, to execute and see to the end, whether it's a timeline of two years, three years, fully funded, full collaboration, that company will be more successful than they are today. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I think I share that. I think I've seen I've seen that disempowerment, I think, too many times. Um, and I think my I'm gonna piggyback on yours, but I would say like I wish that, but I, I wish the chief data officer would do something slightly different, right? And and that is instead of, you know, going after these projects that could take two or three years before you see an outcome go for start with some quick wins right especially if you've just gone into a new cdo role i would always recommend uh to cdos cdo to talk to look there's a lot to do there's a lot of good stuff to do but sometimes as human beings as executives sometimes our attention spans are short not everyone's going to remember what we started doing two or three years ago but if you can show a quick win right three months, six months, nine months, whatever it is, it goes a long way towards building up that credibility and that trust. And, and that goes a long way towards that empowerment, right? And for those projects that will take two years and so forth. So, so that's kind of the thing that I, I always kind of recommend to folks is like all the good stuff, all well intended, right? But as we all know, Right. We, we do. We do live in a time where people, you know, sometimes have short attention spans. I agree. And just to add on top of it, it's not just the quick wins, but having really good storytelling skills. And that's where another thing, another gap that I see chief day officers not do very well is not being able to articulate what those small wins means yes. in the larger picture. Um, yes. It's great to have small wins. And to celebrate it, but sometimes your executives may not realize the what, value. What does it mean for us? Like, why does exactly. it matter? Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, those are the best partners I love to work with that they have excellent data storytelling skills and they understand the value of small things like being able to scan 30% faster or we we're able to get petabytes of files deleted much faster. Like, what does that mean in the long run? Being mm -hmm. to yeah. Explain that in a in a story that makes sense for the industry and the company is very key as well. No, I, I think I think you're you you hit it on the head. Totally agree with you. And unfortunately, uh, that's all we have time for. Uh, Peggy, I can talk to you for hours on end. It's always fun running into you at trade shows. I don't know when the next one you're going to be at, but uh, I'll be at Big Data London. So if you're going to be there. Right. 
I'm a big deal. Right. Look at that. We might run into each other again, hang out. That would be fun. But I want to thank you, Peggy, for joining me on the Data Fabric Show and sharing your experiences and your insights. Um, I think there was a lot of good stuff. I learned a lot. I, I'm sure the audience is going to learn a lot as well. And so let's definitely stay in touch. I'm going to see you in London. But thanks again and have a good one. Thanks so much, Casey. 